Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I am a filmmaker and a writer that's been working with CCF for 10 years, going on 11. So that's a decade of, of working with them to produce video content, some like the, the live video series you'll watch today, some that are patient-centric documentary style stories, some that are dense treatment-based videos, but they all have the same mission in mind, and that is to, to raise awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do, but we have quite the database, quite the library of videos, and I encourage you to check those out uh, after the show or anytime. You can reach them at the videos tab here on Facebook or on our YouTube channel uh, if there is a topic in this net space. I guarantee you we have probably covered it in a video. Uh, if you're new to the show, uh, please say hello and chime in on the comment section. Let the people know where you're from. If you are a regular, you're probably already doing that. So uh, a big part of what we do here at the show, besides the information from our guest, is the community uh, of people uh, in the comments, patients, caregivers, support group leaders, and I really encourage you to lean on them because this community will embrace you, I promise you. Before we get started, uh, we want to thank our sponsor, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. Folks, without their support, we wouldn't be able to do the show, but we have this disclaimer from them that we always like to say at the top of the program, and that is that the opinions expressed today by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Luncheon with the Experts ahead of time. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of these views, opinions, or information that will be provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed today by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. All right. It's always a lot of words, but the point is really that last line. We don't know our, your specific case. Our guest today won't know your specific case. So um, we're going to give you some good advice, some good general direction and answers to your questions. But take those answers and that advice back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan and path forward for you. Because if there's anything I've learned in that 10 years working with CCF is that each case of this disease is unique and therefore each plan and path forward is as well. So folks, let's go ahead and get into it today. I'm, I'm excited to welcome back to the show a guest that we have had on before, whom I've worked with a couple of times, Dr. James Howe. How are you, Dr. Howe? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Rain. Absolutely. Welcome back. I know that I, I, you and I know each other a little bit. We've worked together a couple of times, but for those who may not be familiar with you and your work, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and the role that you fill in this net community. Well, I'm a surgeon. I'm at the University of Iowa. I'm the uh, head of surgical oncology and endocrine surgery, but my specialty is mostly neuroendocrine tumors, mostly of the small bowel and pancreas and their liver metastases. So I've written a lot on subjects related to those tumors. I'm also a basic science researcher, and we have a laboratory that works on uh, human neuroendocrine tumors and trying to develop new uh, drug treatments uh, for them, uh, as well as doing genetic uh, expression studies to try to diagnose sites of unknown primaries or to, to look at sensitivity to various drugs. So kind of work in the lab, but most of what I do is clinical. And um, I'm happy to be part of this uh, University of Iowa group that uh, has had so many excellent people that we work with. You know, we have a great group and we're a center of excellence uh, from ENETS and Joe Dillon from Endocrinology is part of our group. Tom Odoricio, who has just passed uh, recently, which we're all real sad about, uh, is really the founder of our group. His uh, wife, Sue Odoricio, also uh, very important with treating pediatric patients and opening up trials for uh, uh, different kind of radio uh, imaging and radio pharmaceuticals, uh, early studies of PRT. Um, and then Dr. Chandra Sakharan from Medical Oncology and great group in nuclear medicine, Dr. Menda. I'm just giving a shout out to all these people that I'm so fortunate to work with and just making the point that the multidisciplinary aspect of this disease is so important to have mm -hmm. you know, these key members of the team. So that's 
who I am, I guess, in a, in a nutshell. Yeah. And, and I think we'll get, we'll get back to that a little bit, but I, I agree. It's such an incredible team and I feel very fortunate to have worked with many of you. And as you uh, mentioned, um, definitely a shout out and special love sent to the Odoricios. Um, I've mentioned this almost every other week because uh, uh, Dr. Odoricio was a big friend of the foundation and the show and my, and myself. And so that, that was a big loss for the overall community. What a, what a great person he was. Um, a couple of uh, people sending their shout outs to you, Dr. How Bridget says my favorite person, tell him hello from Bridget and Brian. He's our doc and wrote a journal about our family. And uh, from Julie, hello, Dr. How I'm so lucky to be a patient of yours. Thanks for sharing your expertise today. So uh, fans of yours are also in the audience giving Thanks. their love. Yeah, yeah. And the numbers are looking great today, folks. So we're going to get started in just a while. I have a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we do before we start taking questions. But listen, go ahead and start sending your questions in because as soon as I'm done, we're ready to roll. Uh, but the show is going to go like this. You're going to send in your questions. I'm going to ask as many of them as I can to Dr. How during this next hour. Folks, inevitably, we don't get to them all because you ask so many. The good problem that creates is we have the show uh, every week, so we can always come back. But if you have a follow-up question or you didn't get your question answered, I encourage you to reach out to CCF after the program is done. You can message them here on Facebook or you can reach them at carsonoid.org. The show will, the video will live here. It'll be evergreen on the Facebook page, so you can always watch the replay. Starting next week, it'll be available on YouTube uh, for those who don't have Facebook. But the real um, benefit, I think, is this interactive one-on-one -on -one session, uh, asking a question that you or your home team has been struggling with. So if you know someone, I see some of you have already been doing this. If you know someone that needs to be here or they usually are here and they forgot, go ahead and tag them in the comments, send them a text, email, smoke message, whatever you got to do, let them know the show is going on. Uh, again, they'll be able to watch the replay, but the real benefit is getting a question across. And another ask that I have from you all, which you do a great job every week it, uh, of is if you see a comment or a question in the sidebar that you also have, or you're interested in the answer to, uh, you can like that question just under the question. It gives you the option to like it. And that effectively upvotes it for me. If I see eight people have the same question, I know it's going to be in demand and as I'm trying to churn, churn through the hundreds of questions that we get, I'll know that I need to get that one across so that we can uh, reach as many people as possible. So, all right, go ahead and start sending in your questions. We're going to scroll along and we're going to talk to Dr. Howe here a little bit from some questions I have. First of all, Dr. Howe, you mentioned that most of your practices with neuroendocrine tumor patients, how, what is, what, could you put a percentage on that? I'd say about two thirds. About two thirds. And, and, at what point did you start kind of heading down that specific path? Do you, did it happen somewhere in your career where you, where you really understood that like, Hey, this is a passion of mine or how, how did that become such a big part of your practice? Well, I can pinpoint it exactly in 1999 when Tom Odoricio and Sue came to the university of Iowa. Wow. You know, Tom came and said, you know, we need a surgeon to help us with neuroendocrine tumors. Are you interested? I said, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I didn't know that much about them. And, and then, you know, we gradually saw more and more patients and it, be, it became a real passion. You know, after a few years, I realized that uh, these are really complicated cases and we could really make a difference. And, you know, Tom was a really enthusiastic supporter of surgery. And one of the things I would say to the patients out there is that, you know, many of you have been to many different institutions and there are different flavors for different places. Some are very medically oncology driven and, uh, you know, focus on drug treatment. And then there are others that might be more surgical or more interventional radiology related. And it really has to do with the expertise at that center. There might be one really good practitioner in neuroendocrine tumors who's a medical oncologist, for example, but maybe they're not as strong in the other elements. And, um, you know, Tom, really believed in the value of surgical cytoreduction and removal of primary tumors. And, uh, and that really uh, kind of, uh, you know, set the stage for my thinking about these tumors and uh, the evolution of my knowledge and uh, of these things uh, over the last couple of decades. You know, you mentioned um, people like Dr. Odoricio and the other members of the team there. Uh, at Iowa, and you also alluded to the importance of a, a multidisciplinary team. We've also done a video on that before, folks. 
can we talk a little bit about that for, for the people to really understand what that means, what that entails, and who actually is involved in that, in that comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary team that you have? Well, in our clinic, uh, which for me, I only have one day of clinic a week, and it's on a Wednesday, and Dr. Dillon is in clinic mm-hmm. near me, and Dr. Chandra Sakaran, so that's our endocrinologist and medical oncologist. And we commonly would see patients that, you know, come from a distance to see all three of us. And, and we kind of will all see and process the information independently. And then we'll have a conversation during that day about where we think we should go with that patient. Mm-hmm. Um, and we all have worked with each other for long enough where we kind of know what the other's thinking, but everybody brings a, a little bit of uh, specific knowledge to their area like Dr. Dillon doesn't really know if I can cite or reduce this patient or not, or whether we should go with PRT. He's got to hear it from me, but he has a pretty good suspicion, you know, when he looks at the scans that it's going to go this direction or that direction. And so does Dr. Chandra Zakarin. So we've been working together for a long time and that's our multidisciplinary team who is making decisions. And then if we need to, if we think embolization or IR is the way to go, then we'll get a hold of Dr. LaRoya and, and, and tell him that we think this is the way to go and he will look at it and he'll get back to us. And if it's nuclear medicine, then we have a PRRT tumor board that Dr. Dillon will bring those cases to that tumor board with our nuclear medicine physicians and medical oncologists to discuss. We have a a GI neuroendocrine tumor board where, where we will discuss these challenging cases and we'll discuss all the post-operative uh, findings to figure out what the next step is. So that's that's kind of how we do it here. Uh, but every place is a little bit different. Got it. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to explain that. And folks, uh, uh, like I said, we have a video on that. And, and the importance of a multidisciplinary team is really, uh, we cannot say that enough. Uh, well, Dr. Howe, we've already got a lot of great questions coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and start uh, pivoting to those. Um, first question comes in from Gina. Will Dota talk ever become available? Dota Tate is only 75% accurate. I'm not sure if, uh, that is, is correct, but, um, what do you think? Well, we used to talk for a long time because, uh, that's what Sue had developed. And I don't mm-hmm. know if we're talking about imaging or if we're talking about treatment, but, um, I think, you know, cause you can use Dota talk. It's just basically, TOT versus Tate is a different uh, binding agent for the uh, radioactive molecule to bind to the somatostatin analog. And there are just slight differences between Tate and TOC. And I'm not really sure. And there's also something called NOC, if that's not enough. Um, and I'm not sure like how much better one is than the other, but um, and so will TOC be available? It might be. I, I guess I'm not, this is not my area of expertise, but the patent on Tate may uh, run out sometime soon. And then you may see talk getting into it a little bit more. I know that uh, ediotriotide, uh, this European uh, compound that's coming to the United States now is talk and not Tate. uh, And that's for uh, therapy. And I'm not sure about imaging, but so it's just another variation on the, the same. Uh, it's just the linker. Um, so it, it's not any better, but I think you'll see talk if that's really the question. Got we'll it. See, we'll talk. Hey, hey, so uh, Gina, thanks for your question. And this goes for you and anyone else. Uh, if, if you know, I misinterpreted a question or if we needed more clarification on anything uh, and you all are still on the, the call, you can always chime in later. Do me a favor. Give me a little bit of uh, context, like in reference to, you know, what you said before, because there's so many questions. If I just see somebody 30 minutes from now saying like blurting out a word, I, I'm not sure where the connective tissue is, but if you're still here and we, um, uh, need a little bit more clarity from you, please feel free to, to chime in and follow up uh, or if it presents a follow-up question for you. Uh, but thank you. Next question from Recep. Recep. Uh, hello, I wanted to ask about TARE, T-A-R-E, transarterial radio embolization. Is it better before surgery on the liver or after based on your experience? Well, uh, TARE is what we would also call radio embolization. It's where you have yttrium beads that are sitting on, you know, small particles and they're directed up into the hepatic artery 
and they're generally dispersed into the liver. And the idea is that these small particles then lodge in capillaries near tumors and then kill these tumors or injure them with radiation. So there are some centers that use a lot of tear. We use, we use it, spare, I won't say sparingly, but there, there are some questions about whether you get a radioembolization, whether PRRT, the combination of those things together can be more harmful. Some people think you shouldn't do the two together. Other people think it makes no difference. Uh, as far as surgery before or after, we wouldn't, if we think we can do a surgical cytoreduction, we wouldn't necessarily treat them with radioembolization first. We kind of save that for progression. However, there are some individuals who have lots of small tumors distributed through both lobes of the liver and where a surgical cytoreduction, and what I mean by that is getting out as much tumor as we can, and we have to get most of it out in order to make a difference. Sometimes there's too many tumors and they're too small where we can't really do that surgically, but maybe we're gonna go in and operate and take out the primary tumor in the small intestine. Those are some patients that might benefit from radioembolization. So some of those patients we might do up front to get the liver disease under control and then take out the primary. But if we were gonna try to remove them, we wouldn't wanna potentially injure the liver by doing radioembolization first. More commonly, we might do the surgery, do our best side of reduction. And then after several years, if tumors are kind of coming back, then give radioembolization. So sequencing, Again, it can be very important. It's one of the things that people, including physicians, don't understand, and there's no right answer. There's no perfect roadmap, and uh, you know, on a case by case basis, we got to figure that out. Got it. I appreciate that. Um, and thanks for your question. Next question from Gary: What procedure, if any, can be used to effectively treat neuroendocrine tumors in the abdominal peritoneal? So I think what Gary's referring to is peritoneal carcinomatosis. Okay. And that's a situation we see fairly commonly when people have tumors of the small intestine that grow through the wall of the intestine. Hmm. And now these cells can then just drop into the abdominal cavity in different places. And you'll often get big nodules under the diaphragm, down in the pelvis, and in between loops of bowel. And this can be a very challenging situation. Um, if I operate on somebody with a small bowel tumor who has this peritoneal carcinomatosis, I try to take out as much of this as I can. Unfortunately, sometimes, besides having some larger lesions, there are often hundreds of very tiny lesions. And with those, we'll use uh, an argon beam electric artery to try to kill those small ones, but it's not 100% effective. And, and really, when you have a few hundred of these, it can be very challenging. The ones that get people into trouble the most are ones that might be between loops of intestine and have the bowel stick to it. Another loop of bowel that can cause a bowel obstruction. And then also in the pelvis is a pretty common area where people get these tumors that kind of drop onto the sigmoid or rectosigmoid colon, and then they can cause an obstruction. So if I know that's already going on, I might do a resection of that part of the colon, the, the rectosigmoid, and then reattach it at the same time. I've got a few cases coming up where I think I need to do that in, in addition to taking out the primary tumor. Um, so it is a difficult problem and, you know, we try to do as much cytoreduction reduction as we can, but it's not a perfect operation. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Julie, Dr. Howell. I've had three debulking surgeries. The last one was done uh, three years ago. I know I have several small tumors in my liver and small abdomen. We are just watching the tumors and keeping track of their growth. I get a lanreotide shot every month. Is there anything else that I should do? I also see a local oncologist uh, in Dayton. Well, I think it's a great question. Julie, you know, a lot of people have looked out to see, oh, can I change my diet or is there some supplement I can take that'll make this better? And I, I'm not really sure that we know of anything like that. Um, but I think the situation that you mentioned is something that, I probably saw 15 patients yesterday with that same situation where they have small liver lesions after they've had a, a good surgery and they've been on uh, somatostatin analogs. And our approach here is to continue the somatostatin analogs until there's real progression. And then on progression, then treat them with PRRT for small bowel tumors. Uh, 
The only options with small bowel tumors are really BRT and everolimus. I mean, those are our best options besides liver-directed therapies, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Whereas with pancreas, we have some more options systemically, like sunitinib and everolimus and capecitabine temozolomide. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, the 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 least that the least invasive or toxic treatment that we have is somatostatin analogs. And if we can get them to just keep the tumors at a, a, at a, a low size that, that slowly progress, we'll do that as long as we can and then kind of take up a notch when there's clear progression. Got it. Thank you. Hey, folks, if you just joined us or join us a little bit late, this is Luncheon with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program. We're here with Dr. James Howell today and lots of questions, lots of attendees in the room. So we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, appreciate you all being here from Gene. How long can one be on CAPTEM before taking a break? And is surgery an option if on CAPTEM? Well, it's a good question. You know, we, we will commonly use it for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and there have been uh, trials that have shown that it, it can be very good with response rates of 50% uh, or so. And we'll commonly use it before surgery in patients who have very large liver lesions from a PNET or a PNET that looks unresectable or very difficult to resect. And Really, I mean, I've seen patients have been on CAPTEN for maybe as long as three years, but we generally won't use it for more than a year. Mm -hmm. And if we're getting a good response from a patient, say, with a lot of disease with a PNET, I've, had, I've really seen some remarkable responses with it. And I've taken patients to the operating room a year later who, when they showed up, you would say, there's no way we're ever going to be able to, to really do a good job on this and then had really good shrinkage with that. So maybe a year, uh, Dr. Chandra Skarn would, would treat people and then give them a break. And, and then, you know, I've seen some patients come to the clinic who've been on it longer, but I'm not sure if that is a great idea either, uh, just because there is toxicity. It's chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Kind of a follow-up question still in the CAPTEM realm. Uh, Timothy says, have you had patients that upon diagnosis were not candidates for liver debulking surgery due to excessive tumor burden, go on CAPTEM with fantastic results and then do surgery on them? Oh yeah, yeah, many times. And so it's really good for that. Um, and again, I gotta let everybody know that that works really good in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but small bowel, not so much. Okay. So it's a special thing for pancreas tumors, but yeah, they can have a really good response. And like I said, it could look just awful. And then after three, six months, you're starting to see these tumors shrink. And I've seen, you know, tumors this big turn into tumors this big. And all of a sudden, you know, 50% liver replacement becomes 10%. And, uh, and then I know I can really do a much better job. All right. Thanks for your question, Timothy. Hopefully that helped. Uh, next question from Debbie. Can thyroid nodules possibly be neuroendocrine tumors? Yes. I mean, I've done a thyroidectomy on a patient with a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, but I would say that's an N of one of many hundreds. So I think it's pretty rare, but it can happen. Got it. Thank you. Uh, back to CAPTEM. You mentioned this, uh, but this is kind of a follow-up question. Jerry says, "What? why do some oncologists suspend CAPTEM treatment after one year? Well, I think it, you know, it has bone marrow toxicity. And after a while, your counts may suffer, you know, so your white blood cell count may go down, mm -hmm. your platelets may go down. And, you know, any chemotherapy has toxicity like that. And so I think that's the main reason. Got it. Uh, from James, is there any info, info on sandostatin octreotide injections being available in the pill form in the U.S.? Well, there is a trial coming up, and Dr. Dillon is going to be running that trial here. Nice. Um, and so that medicine, and I can't remember the name of that, um, but yeah, it is available. It's not really, so I did talk to the, one of the representatives from the company just uh, a week ago in Lexington, and he was telling me more about it. It's not a somatostatin analog per se, uh, but it, it's a chemical that binds to the somatostatin receptor, the same one that somatostatin binds to. And it carries out inhibition of that receptor like 
a somatostatin analog. Maybe this is too much chemistry, but I, I was really fascinated to hear that it's actually not a peptide like uh, octreotide or lanreotide or sandostatin. It's a chemical that binds to the receptor. But yes, that is available and trials will be beginning very soon with that agent. Awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, thanks for your question, James. Next question from Timothy. We've talked a little bit about this uh, today. Uh, Timothy says, for tumors in the tail of the pancreas and after surgery, surgical removal of, okay, of that, uh, what percentage of, of patients end up getting some form of diabetes, if any? Well, it's a good question. I mean, it really depends on where you're starting from. Uh, so there are some people who are going to get diabetes without these tumors, and there are certain risk factors like obesity. Um, or chronic pancreatitis. But, uh, you know, in America, obesity is a, a huge driver of diabetes. So, um, so there's that factor, but then there's also how much pancreas do we need to take out? So if we take out half your pancreas, you're more likely to become diabetic than if we take out 20% of your pancreas. And then if you're thin versus obese, then the, the risks are modified even more. So you mentioned a tumor in the tail, it, was it a 10 centimeter tumor in the tail or was it a two centimeter? Because if it's a two centimeter tumor at the end of the pancreas, you're probably not going to be diabetic if you weren't pre-diabetic already. Mm -hmm. If it's a 10 centimeter tumor and you got to take half the pancreas, well, if you're pre-diabetic, you're probably going to be diabetic. If you were not, um, then you might or might not become diabetic. So it really depends on the volume of pancreas that's removed and what your other risk factors are. Got it. Thank you. Moving along, next question from Aaron. For asymptomatic, very early stage, low-grade primary net in the terminal ilium, discovered incidentally during a routine colonoscopy, is the watch and wait surveillance ever an option, or do all nets grow and metastasize? Great question. Well, I... The watch and wait is okay for people who might be really elderly or really infirm where surgery would be dangerous. I would say that most ileal tumors are gonna have lymph node metastases. It's pretty rare not to have a lymph node metastasis and a lymph node metastasis is one step away from liver metastasis. So uh, I would not advise too many patients to watch and wait, although, you know, certainly in the patient who has like a lot of metastatic disease in the liver where the, some might, people might think the horse is already out of the barn that, you know, removing that primary isn't going to change that too much. But um, that's a point of contention that maybe we'll get into later. But um, if you just have a primary tumor in the ileum picked up on colonoscopy, I would take those out because those patients are will probably have lymph node metastases right now when you do that hemicolectomy, uh, ileal colic resection. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you leave that in for 10 more years, well, it's probably gonna end up in the liver. So if you're young and you're in good shape or even middle age in good shape, I would push you to take that out. Good point, thank you. Gina says, thanks for hosting this zebra party. Absolutely, Gina, we are here every week and I believe that this is the first time I've seen your name. So if this is your first time being on the show, welcome, hope you, hope you come back. We're here every Thursday at the same time. Next question from Julie, after surgery, do you hand off a patient to medical oncology at a multidisciplinary center? Um, it sort of depends who you are or where you are. Mm -hmm. I don't. I follow my patients long term or until they get sick of me, which might be shorter <laughs> than that. But uh, we like to see the patients back together because I think we all bring something uh, different to the table. Um, there are some patients who don't require operations who I may hand off to the medical oncologist after we've seen the patient once or twice. And it's pretty clear that my role isn't that important. But in patients that I've operated on, I like to continue seeing them back because there is a role for second surgery. Uh, and I am pretty well versed on the other treatments available as well. And in conjunction with my other colleagues, I think you know having a discussion is helpful to figure out the next step. Got it, thank you. 
Oh, next question from Eileen. Eileen says, hi, I was diagnosed in February this year with a left lung carcinoid. Uh, after one dotate scan with stage four with another small spot uh, on my right and possible involvement in the lymph nodes, uh, I have no symptoms and I had very bad pneumonia in 2006, followed by uh, followed for scarring. The oncologist says, do nothing until I get symptoms. Does, does that sound right? Yeah, I say lung carcinoids are probably the more mysterious of the, the group as far as, you know, my practice, because I don't see right. a lot of lung carcinoids, although I do see those with liver metastases. And sometimes I'll, I'll take out those liver metastases because, you know, the lung carcinoids aren't always... Uh, uh, responsive to somatostatin analogs. Some are, but many don't have the receptors and PRT uh, options are more limited. So um, there is a role for surgery in those patients. Um, whether you should do nothing, I don't know. There are, there are a lot of lung tumors that probably behave in a very benign fashion and can be watched over time, but uh, it, it's a complicated question. There are typical carcinoids, there are atypical carcinoids, there are these weird things called dip necks that are yeah. a little bit earlier on than that and, and even more confusing. But the whole thing that's different is the response to somatostatin analogs is not as predictable as with more of the small bowel and pancreas. So that may not be an option for you. Um, and I've seen all sorts of things where they get removed surgically sometimes and sometimes I'm removing the liver metastases. They still have their primary in place. And uh, it is a little confusing even to me sometimes. Got it. Thanks. Admit that. <laughs> Thanks, Eileen. And I uh, just wanted to make mention that Eileen uh, KR chimed in saying he had almost the same thing going on in their case. Uh, and folks, I just want to encourage you, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, half of this is uh, is really about the information from our guest, uh, but also you all sharing your own experiences and stories with each other. So if anyone, this goes for Eileen's question or anyone else's, if anyone uh, has information that could be helpful as well, feel free to share in the comments to each other. That's also uh, very helpful, I have found. Next question from Gary. Gary says, can you give the pros and cons for resecting the primary early on? Yes, I sure can. Uh, so the pros, um, if you resect it early, it won't get as big. Okay, so when it gets big, we talked about that peritoneal carcinomatosis. If you wait too long, it can grow through the wall of the intestine, and then you might have that problem with carcinomatosis. Uh, the other thing is if you wait, it might obstruct. Now, a lot of these tumors can be really small. I mean, they, they may be the size of an M&M, &M, and that probably won't obstruct. And it's really amazing that you can have a tumor that small and still have big lymph nodes or even a lot of liver metastases. And this is one of the phenomena that is a little bit curious about neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but a lot of people have their operations for their small bowel neuroendocrine tumor because they got obstructed. So you don't really wanna have an operation when you have a bowel obstruction because the likelihood is that operation is not gonna be as good and not gonna be as thorough as one that you have in a more elective setting. And what I mean by that is when your bowel is blocked, it's all big and dilated. It doesn't hold stitches as well. It's more like the leak when you put it back together. And the surgeon is just trying to get you out of that jam. It may not do as, as big a lymph node dissection as you might need, might leave lymph nodes behind. It probably won't do any liver side or reduction um, and probably won't take out your gallbladder if that's important, uh, which it is in some cases. So that's another reason not to wait. Um, they can sometimes bleed. That's not a huge uh, problem with most carcinoids, but some people will present with anemia and it'll be a source of blood loss. Um, so those are a couple of the pros. The other ones are taking the tumor out at an earlier stage. If you knew your tumor is gonna be removed, you probably wanna remove it early rather than late because then it has more of a chance to spread. Now the cons, the cons are it's an operation. So you have to have an incision, even if it's done laparoscopically, which again, I'm, I'm kind of proponent of, if you're gonna do it laparoscopically, you gotta palpate the entire small bowel because most people have more than one tumor. Um, and if you just 
if you don't use your fingers to feel the bowel, you're not going to uh, feel the additional smaller tumors that might be there that you could have resected at the same time. Um, but even with that kind of approach where you have a small incision, they're going to make an incision that big. But typically, we might make a bigger incision. Um, and so you have to recover from that. So that's a con. It might put you out of action for six weeks. Um, and there's risk with surgery. If you have a bad heart or if you have carcinoid heart disease or some other issues, then you can get in trouble with surgery. So surgery is a stress test on the body. So there, it, those are really the cons. Got it. Very thorough. Thank you. Next question from Timothy, who is bringing the heat today with the questions uh, for site of reduction liver debulking surgery. If you could put a timeline on it, what is the time clock reset on average? Uh, and how, how much time does it buy? Hmm. No, that's... That, that's that's a good question. And that's really the rationale that we're doing it for, Tim, is to set back the clock. And in other words, if somebody shows up and they have 10 liver mats that are taking up 30% of their liver and I can get rid of most of those, then they're starting over from a much smaller amount of disease. And I think, you know, the benefit that, anybody with carcinoid has over other types of tumors is their slow growth. And so that can really turn out to be something that might give you a five or 10 year improvement in survival if you can get that side of reduction. And then the question is like, how much do you need to get out? And that's a debate that we have among surgeons all the time. Um, it used to be thought that if you got 90% of the, the metastases out, that you would get a survival benefit. But more recently, Dr. Pommier's group in Oregon and our group at Iowa have shown that maybe if you get 70%, that people still get a significant survival advantage. Those studies are all flawed in that they're not randomized trials, which is what we really would like to have in most diseases if we test therapy A versus B. Uh, but these are not patients that can really be randomized. So th those data are based on looking at patients' lifespans over controls who, who maybe didn't have surgery uh, from the, like a, a large national database. Those data. Okay. Next question from Ronald. What is the difference between radioembolization and PRT, and which is better for multiple metastases in liver that are too small for surgery? Okay. All right. So the difference is they, well, the, the similarity is they both have radiation, but the radiation is delivered differently. So with radioembolization, you are putting a catheter in usually through the groin up into the artery to the liver and injecting particles that just are linked to say yttrium 90 beads. And so there's no somatostatin in there. And those lodge in the capillaries and then kill the tumors based on their proximity. Um, and so that is a good uh, method of therapy for patients who have scattered bilobar metastases. PRRT is where you give it intravenously. And what you're giving in the United States anyway, right now is lutetium-177 that is bound to the somatostatin molecule. And that travels around your body and specifically binds to somatostatin receptors. So the radioembolization, there's no specificity. It's just blocking a little blood vessel in the liver. And uh, PRT is traveling around your body and binding to sites in the liver, sites in the abdomen, sites in your bone. I mean, it goes throughout your whole body and specifically will land on things that have the somatostatin receptor. And then that lutetium-177 gets internalized into the cells and then can do damage to it. And as you know, there are other isotopes that have been used for that. We used to use yttrium-90, but that caused more kidney toxicity. And people are working on really promising studies with alpha agents like lead or actinium. And that may be the next generation of PRT. So it's getting back to the question, it's different. You know, you're it's nonspecific with the yttrium-90 radio embolization, whereas with the PRT, it's binding to the receptor. So following up uh, on that, Don says, my embolization didn't work very effectively, still having all the carcinoid problems of flushing, itching, BM, fatigue, and I'm having a PET scan. Uh, is PRRT the next step likely? 
It could be, you know, we think that PRT works better on smaller lesions than really large lesions. And I think, uh, in my personal opinion, I think embolization is really good for people who have large lesions that, you know, can't be removed because it can block off the arterial blood supply to it and, and put the hurt on it. If, if that embolization doesn't work, you know, PRT can probably also do a, a decent job, but Again, we think it works better in smaller tumors because uh, of the penetration and the fact that larger tumors will take up a lot of isotope and, and, and really hog the isotope from getting them to other areas. Um, if it's a PNET, then you know there are systemic therapies that also may make a big dent. If it's a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, you, you might be better off with PRT over say Everolimus, which is the only approved drug uh, to, to take systemically. From our new friend, Gina, Gina says, what is the most common carcinoid tumor chemotherapy? Uh, we mentioned CAPTAM a couple of times a day. Is it that, is it something else? Well, when you say carcinoid, I assume you're talking about a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. So it would be important to establish that because as I mentioned earlier, small bowel versus pancreas, very different responses. And for small bowel, which are also referred to as carcinoids, um, really Everolimus is your, your only approved agent. There are trials going on with cabozantinib, which is tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which uh, are, are accruing right now. And so we may have that agent available, um, but you know, CAPTEM doesn't really work very well in those patients. And okay. so it's really just a Everlemus, which is also known under the trade name Affinitor. Absolutely. Thanks, Gina. Um, interesting question from AG and a few other people. What can Dr. Howe share at this time about his upcoming research in the genetics of neuroendocrine tumors? Well, um, we've done some interesting studies where we've looked at gene expression studies of primary tumors versus lymph node and liver metastases and seeing some interest in differences. You know, another thing that we're doing a lot of is uh, we're growing up patient tumors as spheroids, and then we're doing direct drug testing on them. And we're trying to figure out, you know, the, the different drugs that small bowel versus pancreas are responsive to. And it's, it's interesting that small bowel neuroendocrine tumors are sensitive to many less drugs than PNETs or neuroendocrine carcinomas. Uh, that's not really unexpected. That's what we see in the clinic. We only have one drug for SBNets and we have, you know, three drugs for PNets. Um, but we're hoping to expand the spectrum and also a spectrum of drugs available, but also to try to figure out some of the gene expression differences that might predict a response to drug A or drug B. But, uh, you know, we're trying, you know, one of the limiting factors is, uh, getting our grant refunded. These are expensive studies. And uh, we had a SPORE grant for uh, five years that just kind of ran out and we're reapplying for funding right now. So we're hoping to get funded again so we can continue these studies, but we are continuing them, but uh, um, we're just, uh, you know, sort of limited in, in how complex we can get with these. But I, I do think that we're going to have some really interesting data on on potential new drugs and classes of drugs that might be useful in the clinics down the road. Got it. Thank you. Um, I, Eileen is chiming in. This is just a comment, Dr. Howe. Uh, K, KR, are you online to talk about your situation? This was earlier, folks, when I was mentioning sharing your own experiences and KR had, had chimed in on one of her comments. Eileen, I just want to tell you that um, you can also, if you hit the at um, symbol, which is just shift and then the number two, and then start typing in someone's name, it'll tag them. And that way they'll get a little notification and that hopefully will prompt them to see uh, your comment in case, in case they miss it uh, just like that. But hopefully you all connect. And again, I highly encourage you all to share your own experiences. Each case of this is, is different. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it will always apply, but I've just seen so, so uh, much benefit come from people sharing their experiences. Um, next question from Donald. So we often hear that, tum that the tumors grow slowly. What does that mean? Is that one to two centimeters a year, less? And that's a big question, but. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of patients that we see probably had their tumors for five 
plus years before we even saw them. You know, like patients with small bowel tumors who may have minimal abdominal symptoms, but they get a CT scan done for something else and they have lots of liver metastases. That's a common finding. And those didn't just show up yesterday. I mean, those have probably been brewing for five, maybe even 10 years. And it, it's sort of hard to know about the growth characteristics and in, of individual tumors like that. Uh, but if you look at liver metastases, for example, you can get an idea of the growth uh, each year. And many of these barely grow at all. Other ones, especially as you get into higher grade tumors, they may grow very rapidly. So a quick growing tumor might grow a centimeter or more in six months. But in general, we'll often see no growth or just a few millimeters. So it's very variable. And I think a lot depends on the tumor itself and whether certainly grade, I think, plays a big role in it. A low grade with low mitotic rate is gonna grow much more slowly. And we get an idea of that when we do a biopsy of the tumor and get that KI67 number, if it's really high, like over 20%, that's probably gonna grow quicker. Uh, and if it's really low, like less than 3%, what we call grade one, then it's probably gonna grow very slowly. And tumors can change over time. Sometimes, fortunately it doesn't happen a lot, but we have some patients who go from grade one and then we biopsy a liver lesion that grew in a hurry and find out that now it's grade three. But I don't wanna put you guys make everybody nervous about that because that's an uncommon phenomena. But if that does happen to you on a scan where there's one lesion that just kind of got much bigger than expected, then doing a biopsy of that and making sure it didn't change the grade is important because it might change the treatments that are going to be used. Got it. Thank you, folks. We have just shy of 15 minutes left. So keep sending in those questions. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible with the time we still have with Dr. Howe. Um, Stephanie says, and we've, we've mentioned this and touched on this a little bit today. Any thoughts on the cabozantinib uh, trial? Dr. Wolin has mentioned it to me as the next possible step prior to PORT. Well, it's a trial that's available initially is for people who failed ever lemus, but I think it's also for people who progress after PRT. So it's investigational. I don't really know any of the early results to know whether the patients that are getting this are doing better than people who aren't getting it. So, you know, Jen Chan is running that trial with the Alliance Group, and I, I think the accrual has been very good, and hopefully within a year or two, uh, it might be finished accruing, and we'll know that answer. But right now, I, I don't really have any data to share with you on that. Got it. Thank you. This next question is very important for those that are new to this disease and this journey. Um, Bernadette says, is there a difference? What is the difference between carcinoid and neuroendocrine? Well, carcinoid is an old term that was coined in 1907 uh, by a pathologist to, to say that these tumors, it's a German word spelled with a K, carcinoid, and they look like carcinoma, but they're a little bit different. So he gave it that description. And we've come over time to really consider a carcinoid being a neuroendocrine tumor, mostly of the small bowel, although they're lung carcinoids too, and they all have this very specific look under the microscope that's different from adenocarcinoma, which is a cancer of gland uh, cells like colon cancer, for example. Um, so the difference between carcinoid and neuroendocrine is, well, you know, we also think that carcinoids make serotonin and other vasoactive amines, we call them, stuff like histamine and serotonin that can cause flushing and diarrhea. And so that's usually an important part about the connotation of the word carcinoid. But it's, it's no longer really a favored term because we think using something like a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor is, is more precise because the site of origin kind of tells you more. Um, and neuroendocrine tumors can happen all over the body. They can happen in the thyroid as medullary thyroid cancer. They can be in the adrenal glands as pheochromocytomas. They can be in the stomach, the duodenum, uh, the colon. Uh, and, you know, I think we mentioned the lung. Uh, and not all of those are called carcinoid, but they might all be called neuroendocrine tumors. So carcinoid, I think of as more specific that makes a hormone that causes flushing or diarrhea, mm -hmm. usually small bowel or occasionally lung. Got it. Thank you. I know that's a point of, uh, of confusion for some people, especially early in the, this journey. Next question from Debbie. What is a spindle cell net? 
Well, spindle cells are cells that are thin and long, and that's what fibroblasts kind of look like, but I'm not really that familiar with that particular variant. It's got to be pretty rare, so I, I guess I would need to know more about it, but uh, I don't think I, I need a pathologist to tell me uh, how often they see those. From Cindy, I had a large peanut that spread to the liver, all removed by the Whipple procedure. Uh, how is it that the cancer spread to the liver, but no lymph nodes were affected? And is this a concern for the return of net uh, return of the net uh, elsewhere? Well, I would say that's an unusual situation to have a, a, a pancreatic head tumor like that without lymph node involvement with liver involvement. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, anything is possible. You know, the liver is only that that far away from the pancreas and lymphatics are pretty rich leading from the, the, the pancreas up to the liver. So it's not that hard to get there. Um, so again, I think that's unusual, but I guess it can happen. Uh, and the question about uh, recurrence, what, what was that, Rain? How is it that the cancer spread to the liver, but no lymph nodes were affected? And is this a concern for the return of neuroendocrine tumor elsewhere? Well, I mean, anytime you have liver metastases, that means that the tumor got from the pancreas to the liver, and it could have gotten to other places as well. And if, you know, a really good way to see the extent of disease is to get a gallium scan. And a lot of times you'll see sites of disease that you maybe didn't expect. And not all those sites of disease are going to become trouble for those patients. We certainly see lots of people with bone mets mm -hmm. uh, that you wouldn't know because patients aren't having any pain, but they get a gallium scan, you'll see uptake in the bone. Sometimes you'll see weird lymph nodes, like up in the chest, uh, especially with small bowel tumors, like a left supracavicular lymph node, that may not be clinically that important. They don't need to necessarily be removed. They're not going to cause a big problem. But... Again, answering your question, once it gets to the liver, like it means it usually went through the bloodstream to get somewhere and it could have gone somewhere else. So the implications are that it might be elsewhere and getting a gallium scan would be a good way to look for it. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Lynn. I had PRT two years ago, had bland embolization this past December to the right uh, liver lobe and again in January to the left liver lobe. Does bland embolization into the liver work long? Well, it can, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, like all of our therapies, you know, even PRT, which we think helps people for two to three years on average, you know, some people after a year are getting progression and some people are still good after four years. So it, it's a spectrum. And for liver embolization, I mean, the nice thing about it is you can do it again. It doesn't burn a bridge that you, you can't go back and embolize those lesions, but it, it really depends on the size of the lesion, what they're able to embolize. And that comes down to like, is it a specific blood vessel to that one tumor? Is it embolizing and blocking off the artery to the whole right lobe and the whole left lobe? That may have been what uh, this uh, person asking the question had. Um, and sometimes it can work well for a year or so and other times shorter, but other times longer than that. So it's pretty variable. So it's really hard to answer that question. Got it. I understand. Um, a few more minutes left, folks. Uh, next question from Glenn. I'd be interested to find out the, uh, the opinion, your opinion, on immunotherapy options for high-grade NEC patients. That's a great question. You know, there was a big trial looking at low-grade neuroendocrine tumor patients, and it didn't look like immunotherapy helped that much in those patients. I think it's an area of exploration for neuroendocrine carcinomas. And as you, you may or may not know, those are usually treated with chemotherapy and pretty toxic chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. They're also the cells that are the most rapidly dividing, have more mutations, and cells that have more mutations respond better to immunotherapy. Um, it's sort of hard to do a trial of, of immunotherapy in these patients just because there aren't that many of them. And a lot of times the disease progresses pretty quickly. I do have a few patients who have received immunotherapy and gotten good responses, but I can't say that it's easy to predict who's going to respond. And, and it's a good question for your medical oncologists. Uh, I think it, when your back's up against the wall, it's something that 
should be considered. Got it. Next question from Sharon. My husband is six years being treated for carcinoid that is uh, metastasized from small intestine to the liver. Why is this considered also a blood disease? Is it just how the tumor spread? And if so, I don't understand why bone marrow won't help. It has so little treatment available if kidney problems are also involved. Well, and I'm not really sure what you mean by blood disease, because what that means to me is a disease of red blood cells or something like for white blood cells. So it's metastatic through the bloodstream. So I'll give you that part of it. And that may be what you're getting at. But why does it metastasize through the bloodstream? It's just one of the ways that tumors do that. They'll grow into the wall of the intestine, and then they'll find little capillaries and certain cells that have have enough mutations to be able to do that can then get into the blood vessel and then spread to the liver or other places. So um, again, I wouldn't consider that what I would call blood disease, but metastatic through the bloodstream. And Rain, I forgot the second part of that question. Sorry. Mm. Kidneys and something else. Yeah. It, 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 uh, is it just the tumor spread? And if so, I don't understand why bone marrow won't help. It has so little treatment available if the kidney if kidney problems are also involved so when you say bone marrow i'm not sure if you mean bone marrow transplant um or treating tumors in the bone marrow i mean i, I take it to mean i don't understand why bone marrow won't help i take it to mean i feel like it means transplant um so bone marrow transplant it is an effective therapy uh, Gina, when you have somebody who's going to be treated with really toxic chemotherapy. Um, and that's done in leukemia, some advanced breast cancers, and a variety of different situations. But in neuroendocrine tumors, not too many of, her, of them are sensitive to chemotherapy. And we don't have these good chemotherapy regimens where we know if we treat them with four drugs really hard and and then give them a bone marrow transplant afterwards to, to bring it back, that, that that's going to affect the tumor that much. So we just don't have the chemotherapy to make that, you know, to, to want to treat them that hard. Got it. From Gwendolyn, do you need to have traditional PRRT before alpha, uh, or is it just a condition for, for a specific trial? Yeah, the, the alpha trials are all investigational right now. And okay. so it's very trial specific and there aren't too many places that are doing them. Um, and you can get it in Europe, uh, but here I only know of one center that's doing it in the United States. We hope to be doing it someday in the near future. Um, we hope that when it becomes available that you wouldn't need to fail the other agents first. We might We would go to alpha first if we if we learn that it's superior to the current lutetium-177. We don't know that yet. We all think it's very, very promising, but we haven't seen enough patients get treated and know what the toxicity is. And some of these things that look really good end up hurting your kidneys, for example. Yttrium-90 was a lot like that. So even though we, we wanna put our patients on these trials or as a patient, you maybe really wanna go on a trial, you know, you just need to know that we don't know as much as we'd like to, to give it to everybody. Got it. I uh, just wanted to let you all know that uh, Dr. Robert Ramirez, friend of the foundation says, great to learn from Dr. Hal. Appreciate you chiming in and watching. I guess he didn't learn anything from me. Uh, <laughs> Thanks Rob. <laughs> um, Okay, so last question, Dr. Howe, I, I know that research, as, as you mentioned, is, is a big part of uh, your interest and your practice. What research is going on right now that has you excited? Well, I'm really excited about the stuff we're doing, but, uh, you know, just the genetics of neuroendocrine tumors and all the great work that has been done across the world. I mean, we're learning more and more about these really enigmatic tumors and mm. The, the more that each group kind of figures out the pieces of the puzzle, the more therapies that we're going to have. And uh, so I think for me, it's the genetics, some of the embryologic genetics too, about how different genes are turned on and turned off at different times of uh, gene development is really fascinating. 
And then, of course, like these, some of these new radionuclides, the, the alpha therapy, I think, is really, really exciting, too. So, I mean, those would be the, the top of my list. Yeah, I get I we get questions about that, uh, about that every week. So I think that's that is really exciting. Well, folks, that's our show for today. Dr. Howell, thank you, my friend, for being here and sharing such valuable information. I see all the people chiming in again. They they agree and they really appreciate you being here uh, as well. Uh, so thanks for being back on the show. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thanks to you all at home. Again, as always, we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. Please reach out to CCF at carsonline.org for further information or if you have follow up questions. Again, remember, this video will will be posted right on here as soon as this program is done and you can always watch it. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching and please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everyone. Bye bye.